Let me take you on a hip hop history lesson. Hip hop was born and raised in New York City throughout the 1970s and 80s. But towards the end of the decade, the culture had migrated out west, and groups like NWA were the biggest acts in hip hop. By the early 90s, Ice Cube was king, and Dr. Dre was orchestrating the new sound of hip hop with The Chronic. By 1993, New York was still looking for what their identity would be in the 1990s. Nas and Biggie were still a year away from dropping their debut albums, and the New York artists who had built the city throughout the 80s were starting to lose their artistic momentum. 1993 had some great New York albums, but it all culminated on November 9th, when A Tribe Called Quest released their third album, Midnight Marauders, and the Wu-Tang Clan dropped their debut, Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. There have been a lot of great days throughout hip-hop's history, but November 9th, 1993 is the greatest. These are in my opinion the number one and number two greatest hip-hop albums ever made, and together they represent everything that New York hip-hop is all about. A Tribe Called Quest and the Wu-Tang Clan represent creativity at its finest. Led by their sound architects Q-Tip and RZA, these groups were able to perfect the act of sampling and emceeing simultaneously to create the most pure form of hip-hop ever made. These being group albums reflected the community aspects of the culture, with a profusion of posse cuts and energy that feels like you are right there at the same party the artists are. Just look at these covers. They highlight the collaborative nature in hip-hop in their own ways. Midnight Marauders showcases the faces of all of Tribe's collaborators, contemporaries, and influences, shining the spotlight on each individual and how they all come together in the melting pot that is this album. And Enter the Wu-Tang does the same thing, but in a completely different way. This album cover shows the Wu-Tang Clan members all together in unison, but with their masks on. They are a homogenized force of nature, with each MC bringing their own flavor, but also being a part of this one unit. It doesn't matter who is who on this cover, because they all will wrap you off the map. Sonically, these two albums are opposites. Midnight Marauders feels like it was made in a hip-hop lab. The futuristic tour guide who guides us through the album feels like a precursor to Siri and she is this glossy vocalization of the perfect and pristine sound on the record. And the 36 Chambers has skits and interludes too, but it gives off the complete opposite feeling. Each one sounds like the chaos of real New York life, with people talking over each other and emphasizing the raw reality captured on each track, making the listener feel like they are right there with the Wu in the dungeons of rap. The Wu-Tang Clan is known for having a bunch of MCs in the group, and from this very first record, they all each have their own flair and personality on every track. From track 1, Bring to Ruckus, they all immediately understand what they are there to do. Each MC has a different voice, flow, and delivery, but when they're on a song together, it all fits together perfectly. And the same with Q-Tip and Fife Dog from A Tribe Called Quest. They are able to meet each other with the same energy, but each rapping in different fonts. And that is what both these records bring more than anything else, energy. These albums were released in that sweet spot before all the subgenres of hip hop were coined. There was no conscious rap or horrorcore or even underground and mainstream distinctions. It was all just hip hop. And because of that, these albums have a little bit of everything. The first track to Midnight Marauders is named after Steve Biko, an anti-apartheid activist. Aside from a couple of bars of social commentary, the song has virtually nothing to do with Biko himself. For the most part, it's pretty much just a feel-good party song, but its title puts Biko at the top of the mind to Trojan horse some deeper meanings into these feel-good anthems. Track 5 has Q-Tip rap a whole verse about the complicated nature of the N-word, and the verse is so powerful that he raps it again verbatim later in the song. A verse so nice that he rapped it twice, just to make sure that his point was emphasized. The Wu-Tang members aren't making any grand statements on society here, but their roster of rap royalty represents the epitome of versatility. As a group with almost 10 members, you would think it would be easy for some of them to get lost in the shuffle, but that's not the case. In fact, every single member of the Wu-Tang Clan is completely unique, and on this project each song brings the listener down one step further through each of the 36 chambers. Can It All Be So Simple is the most introspective song on here, with Raekwon and Ghostface reminiscing about the simplicity of childhood and wondering what has happened to this world, and that's followed directly by The Mystery of Chess Boxing, which is this hard-hitting embodiment of the kung fu movies that the crew was raised on. And then the very next track is Wu-Tang Clan Ain't Nothing to Fuck With. This song has the single most headbanging beat ever made. The drums that RZA was able to lay on this track is straight from Heaven's MPC, 
It really cannot be understated just how amazing the production is on both of these albums. Multiple of the most iconic beats ever made were released on this day because of these two. The vibes are totally different, but they both have this mastery of sound that makes some of the catchiest boom bap beats of all time. RZA's production on this project paved the way for New York artists like Nas and DMX to have a darker and more aggressive sound that would still connect to the masses, and Q-Tip's work on Midnight Marauders laid the foundation for artists like Kanye West and OutKast to make artistically rich music that people could party to. I've gone this whole video without talking too much about Fife Dog, but he is incredible on here. The low end theory in Midnight Marauders are his prime to me, and every verse he spits on here is amazing. He has so many quotables on this album alone. On certain songs it feels like every single line is a classic Fife bar. 8 Million Stories is one of the definitive tracks of Fife's career, and really is one of the few story tracks in Tribe's catalog. Telling the story of a bad day, and realizing that it's just one of the 8 million stories happening in New York City that day. Over on the Wu side of things, Method Man has a solo track on here too, with his self-titled banger. This is a star making song. Meth was able to put together lyrical and melodic references to classic songs, nursery rhymes, old TV shows, and more to make this masterful medley of madness. The beat has so much bounce to it and every line is delivered in the most iconic way. The Wu-Tang members are the only rappers on this project, but Tribe shares the love a little more. Trugoy of De La Soul sings the iconic hook on one of the coolest songs ever, Award Tour. Raphael Sadiq plays the bass guitar on the dark after hours anthem Midnight. Large Professor has an awesome verse on Keep It Rolling, and Buster Rhymes lends his Dungeon Dragon vocals for the hook on the flawless Oh My God. These features all embody the faces on the cover of the project, all marauding for ears with a sense of community. You can hear both these albums front to back and hear nothing but perfect hip hop songs. Electric Relaxation was the first rap song that I ever learned every word to. As the token one song for the ladies, a lot of rappers at the time would often water down their sound to pander to a wider audience. But this song doubles down in the Tribe vibe, and it makes for one of the coolest songs ever written. And even with that song as an all-time classic, the Wu-Tang Clan somehow even topped it. With the surefire top 5 rap song ever made, Cream. This song is so iconic that the phrase cash rules everything around me now just lives beyond hip-hop and is a part of the world's vernacular. Everything about this song is perfect, from the iconically simple piano sample, to the intricate production flourishes that fill out the beat, to the fact that every single line rapped on this song is more iconic than some rappers entire careers. If I were to only listen to two albums for the rest of my life, they probably would be these two, and the fact that they were both released on the same day is nothing short of a miracle. And that makes November 9th, 1993, the greatest day in hip hop history. Thanks for watching everybody. We are coming up on the 30th anniversary of that greatest day in hip hop history very soon. So when November 9th comes around, make sure you guys are all listening to both these projects. Let me know what do you think is the greatest day in hip hop history. How do you feel about these two albums? Let me know down in the comments. As always, I want to give a special shout out to my patrons. And I got a lot more headed your guys way. So stay tuned, stay safe, and stay deaf. Thanks for watching.